In the last few years, Moto have developed some excellent devices, although their market share has been fairly muted. Moto flagships have offered unique and innovative features, yet in the wider scheme of things, consumers haven't flocked to them as readily as other phones. The Moto Z might change that. Continuing a tradition of hardware experimentation, the Z is heavily marketed alongside Moto Mods. These have taken recent industry interest in modular technology and run with it. Google's Project Arrow got us interested and LG's G5 came with a few friends. Moto are a step up though, the mods make LG's efforts look like toys. We do need to talk about the mods, the phone's marketing and physical design have been built around the system. Of course you can and most likely will purchase the phone on its own, so we'll focus on the phone itself first. Some incredible engineering and thought is at work with the Moto Z. The main body of the phone is incredibly thin. Side on, Moto have managed to squeeze everything into a tiny 5.2mm casing. It's mad to think that there is a Snapdragon 820, 4 gigs of RAM, a 5.5 inch QHD display, 2,500mAh battery and antenna in there. A couple of caveats however. The camera bulge is very large. You can miniaturize the surrounding electronics all you like, but you can't change the laws of physics. Fitting a mobile camera to meet current flagship expectations requires space. Does the bump need to be this big? Well, maybe not, yet by doing so, the Z does have an instantly recognizable feature. It also doubles as a marker for swiftly aligning and fitting the mods. If this was intentional, then it was clever planning. The second thing is that without using the included style shield, the phone looks a bit unfinished. Gold connector points for the mods are on display, and while the phone is usable in this state, I expect most will want to keep them covered. That shield has a pleasant material touch and finishes the phone. The camera becomes flush with the cover, and the tapered edge follows the curves of the metal chassis. It's clear that you're supposed to use this, and Moto of course sell different colours and materials. Sadly, adding the cover lessens the immediate wow factor of the super thin construction. Personally, I actually prefer to use the handset naked, even if it does look a little unfinished that way. The fascia is very busy. The top bezel holds a wide angle 5 megapixel camera, speaker bar and large flash unit. On the slightly thicker bottom bezel, Moto branding sits above a square fingerprint sensor, itself flanked by two mics. If you pick the white model, you'll also see three infrared lamps. Two either side of the fingerprint sensor and one up top. These disappear on the black unit. These allow Moto display gestures to work, but make the white model pretty ugly to my eyes. Also, let's address the elephant in the room. Being this thin means there's no headphone jack. It must be mentioned, especially since Apple have now made it a major conversation point on the iPhone 7. The Moto Z's only port is the reversible USB Type-C. Type-C headphones are coming, yet right now almost all of us will need to go wireless or use the easily losable adapter. Moto will have planned to drop the jack long before Apple made headlines. It will however be consumer response to Apple's decision that encourages others to follow suit or steer clear. If anything, with iPhone 7 making headlines, losing the jack is less of a deal for Moto than if this was the only mainstream phone to have done it. If this is the future for mobile audio, then Moto can be seen as moving with the times quickly. Early adopters will simply have to learn to get along in this brave new headphone jackless world. A square sensor sits on the phone's chin. The inclination is to press this like a home button, but it is just a sensor. Even after a couple of days, I still go to push it to go to the home screen. It doesn't do that. Annoyingly, any print or decent skin contact will lock the screen. Now, locking quickly without reaching for the power button can be useful, although when you keep doing it by mistake, it gets frustrating quickly. Due to the Z's modular design though, this is the only place for the sensor. It can't go on the back, mods would cover it, and the phone is too thin for a side positioning. You will train yourself out of wanting to push it, but Moto missed a trick here not making it a button. Being picky, I also think it could do with being a touch higher. I like to use phones one-handed, and positioning to use it on the bottom edge makes the phone feel top heavy. It's not, the phone is actually really well balanced, and to be fair, the Moto Z is at the limits of one-handed operation anyway. Anyone with smaller hands than me, two hands will be a necessity. Sensor is fairly quick to respond, and it registered very few failures. As is my experience with most of these, my greasy thumb is probably more to blame than the sensor quality. As a one-handed user, I did have to register my thumb in an awkward side position. Up to five prints can be stored though, so you can provide quick access to other people, or, if you're like me, register both thumbs and different fingers so you can access the phone with either hand or holding position. 
Currently, the sensor is only used for locking and unlocking the screen, alongside Android Pay authentication. By default, there's no securing folders or apps with it. A hangover from Google's time in charge, Moto used the stock Google Launcher with a few extra apps installed. On the surface, you won't find much difference looking at the screen of a Moto Z or a Nexus. Scratch that surface and the Z does have a few tricks. Moto gestures have been around since the original X and continue to provide convenient shortcuts. Rather than looking in the settings, a dedicated Moto app manages which features are turned on. I'll never get tired of double karate chopping for the flashlight. There's a double wrist flick to access the camera, even with the screen locked, and that's a functional alternative to a dedicated camera button. And waving a hand over the IR sensor like a Jedi to flash the notification screen on is always awesome. Other features include eye tracking to keep the display on, flipping the phone over for do not disturb, and shrinking the screen for easier one-handed use. Moto display is used in preference to a notification LED, the AMOLED panel fades in and out as notifications arrive, the waving gesture brings them back if you miss them, the smart notification lets you peek at the content and then decide if you want to open into that app. Finally, Moto Voice can be configured with a personal launch phrase. The grunt work of searches and results is being performed by Google now, but it's still fun to call your phone to action by shouting a choice phrase. With top level internal specs, it's expected that the Moto Z would be no slouch. I'm yet to experience any noticeable lag or slowdown, even when rapidly switching through apps. Jumping from YouTube to one of several open Chrome tabs, off to Facebook, opening the camera, all in one go and it's all seamless. Of course, with an octa-core processor and 4 gigs of RAM, nothing other than buttery smooth interaction would be acceptable anyway. Keeping the interface fairly close to stock can only help here. There are of course tweaks to the software under the hood, but the iconography, animations and interface are mostly Google's own. Also, if you opt into the Motorola ID, then whatever data they're collecting doesn't seem to hamper performance either. When it comes to games, the Snapdragon 820 has you covered. I tried out Asphalt 8, Epic Citadel, Assassin's Creed Pirates. These showcase some of the most current advanced mobile graphics and all ran smoothly even when minimizing and resuming regularly. It was only here, pushing the processor to its limits, did I feel the phone heat up a bit. Interestingly, it got hotter downloading large 1GB update files than actually rendering the games themselves. There's not a lot of room for heat to go in a phone this thin, so with a metal body you also feel the warmth more. This is where the style shield is useful, heat dissipates through it and the phone doesn't feel as warm compared to when it's naked. Outside of large downloads and gaming, I wouldn't say the Moto Z heated up any more noticeably than say a Galaxy S7. It got through a couple of episodes of Stranger Things on an LTE connection with no worries. Last of all, battery life. It's not terrible, but something did have to be sacrificed to market the world's thinnest smartphone, and that something was space for battery. 2,600 milliamps, it's not really enough when powering such a large and high resolution screen. The Android improvements, Moto screen features, they do help somewhat, however, the Z is definitely lacking when compared to the lifespan of its contemporaries. Now, Moto do include a turbocharger in the box, and it's a good idea to keep that with you especially as USB Type-C is still only plodding its way to mainstream adoption. With the turbocharger, you can top up about a quarter of the battery in 15 minutes. Moto's camera has finally stepped up a level, although it is still a little way off matching the best in mobile. Basics first, 13 megapixel sensor with 1.12 micrometer pixels, the aperture is a respectable f1.8, and the module includes laser autofocus and optical image stabilization. So far, so 2016. Thankfully, the camera app has also been improved since the X models. When you grab a top tier smartphone these days, you expect to be able to play with white balance, ISO, exposure, etc. This is all available now in the app's professional mode. Even the basic auto mode lets you focus and adjust exposure with a neat slider. HDR can be made explicit or automatic. Plus, it's simple to switch between auto, regular video, slow motion video, panorama and pro modes with a couple of touches. Slow motion records at 120 frames per second, capped at 720p. Regular video records in 720, 1080 or 4K at 30 frames per second. And there is a 60 frames per second option for 1080p. HDR video is also available. Pretty much all these features are available to the front camera as well, except for the 4K video and panoramas, so you can send slow-mo selfies to your friends if in the mood. A decent quality flash is also installed on the front of the phone, that's fast becoming a must-have feature. Overall, the Moto Z does a good job of upgrading both camera hardware and software to a level suitable for a phone price near top bands. 
Casting an objective eye over the results shows the Z to be a little bit behind the curve still, mostly in low light performance where there's noticeable grain, plus moving subjects prove tough to get right. Whether that's down to shutter speed or digital processing, I can't be sure. Still, this camera can achieve very good results in most conditions and is no longer the lacking feature of the Moto range it used to be. Now, we'll post reviews of each of the Moto mods separately, so for now we'll just do a quick rundown of what you can get. First of all, I'm very surprised and impressed by how well put together and thought out the system is. Mods are secured to the back of the Z with strong magnets, and they don't slip even after a short fall to the carpet. They stay attached in a tight pocket too. Yet they remain quick and easy to remove and swap. Each mod has a groove at the bottom where you slide a finger in and lift up. This leverage makes the mod pop off easily. Aligning the mod is really easy as well. The big camera bump creates a target. All that's left is to wiggle into place. In the center of the 16 connector pins is a central nubbin that guides you. I also have to mention how well integrated the software is as well. As soon as you attach a mod, the phone vibrates, beeps and signals connection. That's swiftly followed by a system pop-up to confirm, which also lets you know the battery status if applicable. The mod is then ready to go. So within seconds, it really is that quick. I was able to put on the Hasselblad, take a picture, swap it for the projector, then display that picture on the wall next to me all in well under a minute. It's a gold star to Moto here. Now the most inevitable mods would be battery packs, of course. With the Incipio, you can add 2,200 milliamp hours, almost doubling the Z's lifespan. Of course, that does the same thing to the phone's size and weight too. Using it is as easy as putting it on. The moment it clips on, power flows, and the battery icon on the notification bar displays a little plus symbol. Other manufacturers are due to release battery power mods as well. Do you like to annoy everyone in the local vicinity by playing loud music in public? <laughs> Only kidding. There are plenty of occasions to beef up the sound quality on your phone. The park, down the beach, at a house party or gathering that doesn't have a decent sound system. The JBL Sound Boost provides two fairly powerful 3 watt speakers and has an internal 1000 mAh battery to drive them. There's a kickstand built in and a deep recess which allows you to continue to use the Z camera. Sound isn't just louder, but richer and more rounded as well. Seriously though, don't use this on the bus or we'll be having words. Mobile photography is very important. Smartphones have all but killed off the traditional point and shoot camera, and camera specs continue to differentiate top phones. If you're looking to improve on the Moto Z camera, then the Hasselblad True Zoom definitely does that. It's a 12 megapixel sensor, which is larger than any you'll find on a smartphone, and also comes with a 10 times optical zoom lens. Throw in a Xenon flash, proper two stage shutter button and raw capture, and you have a very useful unit. It's certainly a niche purchase, it only really suits those who don't already own a dedicated camera, but want something noticeably better than their smartphone. At around £200, the convenience of having one device, plus the instant sharing abilities of the phone, just about outweighs buying a standalone camera for around the same kind of money. Once you, go, once you go beyond this price tag as well, you get to another tier of photography anyway. The only real downside to the Hasselblad is that it doesn't have its own battery. As such, extended use will drone the Moto Z quicker than just using the built-in camera. My personal favourite, the InstaShare projector, delivers a 50 lumens image of whatever's playing on the Z screen. That means your photo gallery, YouTube, Netflix, SkyGo, or just the settings menu. The projector resolution is 480p, which is passable for quick sharing. The claims of up to 70 inch display are also corroborated. A simple kickstand keeps the projector steady, a dial brings everything into focus, and the system can automatically adjust the keystone within a second or two if you change the angle of the surface. 50 lumens isn't that bright, so the projector works best in a dark or dimly lit environment. The colours are also a touch washed out. Even so, as far as I'm concerned, this is gadgetry at its best. The kind of thing is the reason I love playing with new tech, especially when it works as seamlessly as this. During my time with the Moto Z, I didn't find a single person who wasn't impressed by the projector. Now I want to love this phone. Personally, I think it's brilliantly engineered, not just with the super thin casing, but also the mod system, which appears to have been developed in tandem with the phone and is in no way an afterthought. It's the mods though that stops this being an instant purchase. To explain, if you don't buy into the ecosystem, you still have a very good smartphone, however you also have a phone that is constantly reminding you that it's not complete. This isn't through notifications or adverts, but just by the nature of its design. Take the backplate off, and you have a bulging camera and exposed pins. 
put it on and you spoil the effect of the thin phone with a nicely tactile but still comparatively cheap accessory that is also a little bit wobbly. So buy the mods? Sure, but be prepared to pay for them. These are fun gadgets to play with and show off, however they don't come cheap. Still, they are all functional, well engineered and guaranteed to score you gadget man points. You can also buy into these at any time down the line. Part of me wishes there were two Moto Z phones, a mod ready version and a baseline model with a seamless back panel, for those never intending to augment it. Of course, I also wish I had an unlimited supply of KFC popcorn chicken and we can't have everything we want. You're committing a lot of trust here too, anyone spending £400 on a camera and projector for their phone won't be happy if Moto changed the design next year. Now I doubt that will occur, the online backlash would probably be heard on the moon. It's worth keeping in mind though, Moto can't feasibly keep the same chassis on their phones indefinitely. At some point in the not too distant future, these expensive accessories will become obsolete. As a phone, the Moto Z is powerful and gorgeous to look at at the right angles, easily alongside the S7 range as some of the best looking Android devices. As a system, the Z and mods are a fun and interesting experiment. As always, the market will decide on their fate, and with it, maybe modular devices in general. Tech writers and thinkers have wanted this kind of thing for a while now. Moto have put modular theory into practice, so now it's up to us to decide if we want to pay for it.